Good morning, friends, and welcome to Lent. Whether you're here in person or online, we are so happy to have you here today. Today is the first Sunday in Lent. As we begin our journey of Lent, we also begin a busy season in the life of the church. So I have a few announcements for us this morning. The first is that... Uh, a note and reminder that the session has changed its meeting day. I know this is a strange thing for Presbyterians who like to do everything the same. However, we are going to be meeting on Tuesday evenings at 5.30. So if you are on the session, uh, dockets were intended to be sent out Thursday. Um, we got caught up in the office. They'll be going out tomorrow morning. So you can expect your docket tomorrow for Tuesday's meeting. Thank yous all around. Uh, thank yous extended from the Presbytery moderator, and thank you from me to you for all of the work that went into hosting our Presbytery meeting. We had people who moved things around the building, uh, people who came and cleaned up our sidewalks, uh, people who put stuff up and tore stuff down, who ran errands, who checked people in, who made lots and lots of cookies. It looked like a bake sale downstairs. Thank you especially to whoever made the ginger snaps. Those were fantastic. Um, thank you from me to Millie and Eric for filling in on the Ash Wednesday service while I was out last week with COVID. And thank you to all of you for the prayers and well wishes. I am grateful to have had a speedy recovery um, still, uh, am a little bit tired. That seems to be the COVID norm, but otherwise I am feeling uh, quite well, and I am very grateful for your prayers and your considerations while I was out. 
It's also fortuitous and uh, fortuitous timing that Tim had been on the calendar uh, scheduled to preach today. We are glad to have Tim Lanham in our midst. It is always wonderful to see him and have him visit with us. He's scheduled to preach today, and then he will also be offering a moment for mission here as we begin the service. Uh, there will be, starting next week, a sign-up for the Matins Services uh, Talks and Breakfast Hosting. That is coming up soon. We are just four or five weeks away now from the beginning of Holy Week uh, during the first week in April. So uh, take a moment uh, during this week to pray and consider whether or not you would be interested in hosting uh, this year. Our Lenten book study will begin this Wednesday at 6 p.m. We are doing The Case for Easter. That's a Lee Strobel book. Uh, books will be available and passed out the night of the first uh, study meeting. If you are not able to attend but would like to follow along at home, you are invited to do so, and you can pick up a copy in the church office. We hosted Courageous Conversations last week. Thank you to the Chigros for hosting that in my absence. We will have our next Courageous Conversation on March 5th. Thank you to all of those of you who have attended one, of those, one or more of those conversations. If you have not yet attended, I would highly encourage you during coffee hour today, if you would take a moment to talk with someone who has attended to find out what that experience was like. If you've attended one of the Courageous Conversations or more, would you raise your hand so that people can see who you are? So we've got, uh, got a few in attendance today, so take a moment to uh, visit with one of these folks during coffee hour to find out how these conversations are going. Uh, last announcement I have is that next week and the week following, we will have our new members classes for anyone who is interested in joining officially church membership. RSVPs are appreciated, and we can arrange childcare if we know in advance that it's needed. Classes are from 11 to 12.30 both of those days, and it's cumulative. Any announcements that I missed or any that you would like to lift up this morning? All right. I would like to invite Tim to come forward to present our Glacier Camp Moment for Mission. Thank you so much, Jessica. It's really, really good to be here. And I just love all of you, and it's great to come back. I always feel I'm at home when I cross the Continental Divide, and the wind and the temp air temperature are the same, 55 <laughs> degrees. So it's, I love my home on the lake, and it's just great to every morning to have my devotionals while I watch the sunrise over Flathead Lake, but it's always wonderful to come home. This morning, for my moment for mission, I want to reflect just briefly on what we do at camp. And I could spend, literally, hours and hours and hours telling you what we do at camp, including I got a list of things I need to do when I get back from our very capable administrator, Lori Newberry. Besides being the director of the camp, I am the maintenance person, and I'm an apprentice housekeeper. I can't get my windows street free clean. So I'm working on that. But there's, there's lots of things that we do at camp. But this one statement, I think, sums it up. It's very much short and simple and to the point. We feed hungry kids. I thought about this two weeks ago in the midst of our winter fest event for middle and high school age kids. We had 13 kids show up. And it was a great experience. And we started on Friday evening. And late Saturday night, I mean, it was late for me. I hate to concede anything for it to age. But 9.30 Saturday night gets to be late for me. It wasn't late for the kids. They had all sorts of other things going on. But I was getting ready to go home. I was getting ready to check out. So I went into the kitchen and talked to our administrator, who is also our cook and uh, kitchen supervisor, Lori Newberry. And Lori is in the kitchen, and she's furiously chopping away at cold cuts and cheese and getting out crackers. And I said, well, Lori, what are you doing? We already had a snack, right? We already had a snack prepared. 
And she said, what we prepared is not nearly enough. She said, not nearly enough to satisfy this horde of kids. And then she made this observation, which relates to what we do at camp. These kids are so hungry. And our challenge is to feed them. These kids are so hungry. That statement is true in a literal sense. When I was called here 25 years ago, one of the first things I did in my ministry was I taught the fifth grade church school class. I had Emily Chick Brown in my class. Wonderful, wonderful. And how many of you remember E.J. Moran, Mary Lou Doherty's uh, grandson? Anyway, for fun, every quarter we'd go out to eat. And so I, t I remember taking them out for pizza. And before Emily and I could finish our first piece of pizza, EJ had devoured everything. And he was already asking about, could we order a second pizza? And oh, by the way, what about dessert? You know, that's teenage kids. That's growing boys. Kids are hungry. And if you ever come to camp, you'll see this. They're hungry in a very literal sense. They want to eat everything they can, they can find. But there's more to that hunger than just this literal sense. Kids who come to camp are hungry in an emotional sense, and in a spiritual sense, and in a figurative sense. I watch, I do a lot of observations, and sometimes I'll serve our, our meals at camp, and other times I'll just kind of sit in the background and watch. And what I see is I see these kids who are starving, not physically starving, but they're literally, spiritually starving for relationships, for meaningful relationships with their peers, with adults in their lives. And even though they might not know who God is, they're longing for that connection with God as well. And here's something else I've noticed. And I can't say that I know anything about social media. I think I only have 34 friends on Facebook. I haven't looked at my Facebook page in probably six months. Because my life's so boring, nobody wants to see what I'm doing, right? But these kids come so connected. And Facebook, they'll tell me, the counselors will tell me, well, that's just for old people, Tim. The real actions at TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, they're so connected, right? They have all these connections and they put their whole lives online and you think that, that hey, here's some meaningful communion, right? Well, connections are not the same thing as relationships. To use the nutritional analogy, all those connections are like junk food in comparison to the nutri nutrition, nutritional calorie-rich fare we serve at camp. In the opening movement of his very eloquent book, The Confessions, the great Christian Saint Augustine made this observation of God. It's my favorite quote from Augustine. Of God, he said, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Augustine wrote that 17 centuries ago, before the advent of smartphones and technology and Snapchat, and Instagram, and TikTok. And yet what he said 1,700 years ago, I believe, still proves true. If you look at kids today, if you look at the youth today, there is a restless and yearning hunger. A hunger that can only be satisfied through relationships where people can learn to love each other and learn to love God as God loves them. 
At Glacier Camp, we do an awful lot of things. But I think the most important thing we do is feed hungry kids. As Lori said two weeks ago, these kids are so hungry. And I am so grateful for your support, which helps make sure those kids get fed. Thank you so much. One of the worst things as a pastor in the last two and a half years of COVID is the loss of the ability to ask people to breathe deeply. No one wanted to breathe deeply in a room full of other people for the last two and a half years. I think we finally reached a place where we can, again, feel like together as a community, we can literally and figuratively breathed in So let us do that. Let us breathe deeply today. Literally, metaphorically, as we enter into this season of Lent, into this hour that we spend together in community and in communion with one another. Would you please join me in our call to worship? For 40 days and 40 nights, our Savior fasted in the wilderness, tempted to turn from God, tempted to turn to power and privilege. Our Savior resisted. Let us follow Jesus through the wilderness this Lent, examining our temptations resisting them, and returning to God. Let us worship God. Friends, would you please stand in body or in spirit as you are able. Let us join in singing hymn number 275.
We pause here to examine our lives and the ways we have fallen short before our God. Let us confess our sins together. Gracious God, as we wander through this wilderness with Jesus, examining all the world comforts we turn to during times of stress and struggle, we confess the neglect of our faith. We confess all that we place above you, making idols of money, earthly power, and even food. Empty us this plant, O oh God. Guide us in our spiritual practices so we can leave this wilderness season more aware of your presence and the ways our faith can sustain us. Amen. God knows our, our inmost hearts. Hearing our humble confession, God forgives our wrongdoings. Thanks be to God. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Us pray. God of grace, help us seek you and the message you intend for us today. Let us not be distracted by worldly pursuits or pleasures. Help us to focus our hearts and minds on you and your word read and proclaimed today. Amen. Our first scripture is going to be the Luke 1, 34 through 38. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. And it looks like we only have one. So we won't, we won't have a children's message unless Leo wants to come up. <laughs> hey, Jessica, you're on. How are you? Good. Just you and me today. Just, just me. Just you. I saw you right. You're doing Minecraft. Yeah. You like Minecraft? Yeah. Me too. I'm pretty good at it. Yeah. You do? Yeah. Is this one of the haunted woodland mansions? Almost any other color. 
Can you see that? Gray is the strangest color. You can have a gray that looks almost green. You can have a gray that looks almost blue. You can have a gray that looks almost purple. That gray does look old. Yeah, and you can tell them. 
Purple means get ready. Okay. Thank you so much for coming up to talk with me today. You want to head back to your seat and then I'll see you later during coffee time. Okay. <laughs> well, some people call it tea time. Other people call it the time when we go down there to cookies. <laughs> Um, as Leo is heading back to his seat, I would invite you to stand as you are able for our second hymn. Uh, it is a, a, a singable hymn, but it's a, a, one that you're less familiar with. So Kim is going to play it through one time first, and then we will join together in singing. Friends, again, I want to say what a joy and privilege it is to be here, and I appreciate Pastor Jessica's invitation to share these thoughts and remarks. I always like to do a sermon based upon the theme for summer camp, and the theme for summer camp was in the text that Pam read. It's the part of the Annunciation of Gabriel to Mary, where Mary's given this fantastic task, right, to be the mother of the Lord. And she says, well, how can this be? And Gabriel says, for with God, nothing is impossible. So I want us to think about that. As we look at this text, it's a very interesting text from Numbers. Numbers 13, verses 25 through 33. In the Christian tradition, we don't look at Numbers very much. Numbers has a rich interpretive history among our Jewish brothers and sisters, but 
When was the last time you ever heard a sermon on the book of Numbers? Not a lot of attention gets paid to it, but a lot of critical things happen in the book of Numbers, and things that are not good happen to the children of Israel. And this is like the absolute crisis, the crisis that takes their journey through the wilderness and sends it out of control. The spies have gone out, they were appointed by Moses, 12 of them. The spies went out and they reconnoitered the promised land. And we pick up our story with their report. At the end of 40 days, there's another 40 day period, like the period of Lent, the spies returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the Israelites in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Remember the story? They had pomegranates and they had a cluster of grapes that was so huge, it took two people on a pole to carry it. So they show the children of Israel the fruit of the land. After these people had been in the desert for, for two, and, two years and two months. And they said, they told Moses, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Yet the people who live in the land are strong, and the towns are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the land of the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses. And he said, let us go up at once and occupy it. For we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against this people for they are much stronger than we are. So they brought to the Israelites an unfavorable report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land that we have gone through as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great size. And there we saw the Nephilim, the Anakites come from the Nephilim and to ourselves. We seemed like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. My friends, may God bless to us a deeper and fuller understanding of this, his holy word. Let us pray. Almighty and most gracious God, giver of every good gift, Pour out upon us, we pray, a full measure of your Holy Spirit. Take our hearts and our minds and open them, that we might hear your word and be faithful as we seek to follow you in life and in death. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I always like to begin by asking questions. So the question I ask you to consider this morning is, what is the greatest challenge facing the church and its ministry at this place in time, at this point in the year 2023? Lots of changes have happened to the church, even in the last 20 years or so. What do you believe is the greatest challenge facing the church and its ministry in this time and in this place? Some experts have looked at this question and they conclude that the church's greatest challenge is the culture and the society in which we are called to mission and ministry. Years ago, in 
2005 when I was on my sabbatical at the Center of Theological Inquiry in Princeton, New Jersey, one of my colleagues did a major presentation and it was called The Cultural Disestablishment of Christianity in America. And it was actually a lot more interesting than the title. But what he did was he had all this research data and he showed how our nation has turned from a point where it was relatively benign, right? It toward the Judeo-Christian values to an era where there's indifference at best or actual open hostility. Well, this colleague, very smart gentleman, uh, thought that the greatest challenge the church faced is the culture and the society in which we are called to mission and ministry. And who am I to argue with some guy with a PhD, right? I would say there is truth in this conclusion. I remember, and this dates me, but that's okay, I don't care. 50 years ago, when I was in the third grade, Beth will appreciate this, Hillcrest Elementary School, Brookings, South Dakota. Our third grade teacher, Mrs. Peterson, do you know what she did every day for a half an hour after lunch? She had us sit at our desks and she read, and guess what she read from? The Golden Book of Bible Stories. That was okay in that time and place. Could you imagine? What would happen if somebody tried to do that in the public schools of today? Could you imagine how savage our culture would be towards such a practice? At its most generous, our secular culture represents a force that is indifferent to Christianity. Our faith in its practice, at the very best, is simply tolerated. At its worst, it is actively opposed. Our culture and society certainly present challenges to the church and its ministry, perhaps even unprecedented challenges, but to me, they do not pose the greatest challenge. Here's another challenge. I bet you've already thought about it. Another challenge, a challenge which everyone sees, a challenge which has caused copious amounts of wailing and gnashing of teeth in the church of 2023 is this, age. We even talked about it at Presbytery yesterday. We are all getting older. This is especially true for Presbyterians. As in America today, we are literally living up to the literal meaning of the word that names our denomination. Do you know what the word Presbyterian means in the Greek? Gray-haired. So, we are all elders, it seems. Elders who are only getting older. And if I've heard this statement once, I've heard it a million times. We're just an aging church. We're just getting older. Our demographic profile just doesn't look promising. I remember 10 years ago having lunch with a colleague who I very deeply respected and honored. He was a, a colleague of my father's. And we were talking, and he was very pessimistic about the church for this very reason. A person of great faith, right? But this is what he said. I am afraid. I am afraid the demographics are against us. Now, I don't want to downplay that challenge. And I would never argue against the urgency of bringing the gospel's message to people in younger generations. I mean, that's what we're all about at the camp, right? But... I ask people who are preoccupied with this, I ask them, is there anywhere in Scripture that tells us Christ will judge his church the way the media judges successful programming when it hits the target 18 to 50-year-old demographic? Is 
there anywhere in Scripture that tells us that? If there is, I haven't found it. Aging is a challenge for the church and its mission and ministry. We are all getting older, but guess what? That beats the alternative, right? Aging is a challenge for the church and its mission, but it is not an absolute challenge. Now, this is my opinion. As, as you know, remember from the 20 years I was your pastor, you could disagree with me and we'll still be friends, right? But to me, the greatest, most demanding, and most urgent challenge facing the church in this year of our Lord, 2023, is, are you ready, drum roll please, fear. Specifically, this greatest of challenges is manifest in a fear which constricts our individual and collective ability to claim the great promise entrusted to Mary by the angel Gabriel, for with God, Nothing will be impossible. What would happen to the church, to the believing community? What would happen if we took that promise and claimed it and lived in expectation of its fulfillment? For with God, Nothing will be impossible. What daring dreams could we dream? What acts of compassion and love could we imagine in an act if we not only read those words in our Bibles, but shaped our lives with faithful conviction on account of their truth? For with God, nothing is impossible. What would happen if we only believed? I can tell you what would happen if we didn't believe. If under the heavy burden of fear, fear that the culture is against us, fear that we are all getting older, fear that we just can't make it no matter how hard we tried, I can tell you what would happen if we succumbed to this challenge and didn't believe. That story has already been written. And you can read about it in Numbers 13 and 14. So I mentioned when I introduced the scripture, Numbers is a very significant book in scripture. And our Jewish brothers and sisters understand this. There's been a lot of reflection in the Jewish community about the stories in this book. For the Christian community, almost no attention gets paid to numbers. And I wonder sometimes whether or that is whether or not numbers gets ignored because it tells a truth that hits too close to home. The children of Israel are, in the book of Numbers, afraid. They're too afraid to believe. They're too afraid to trust. They are too afraid to claim the promise that with God, nothing will be impossible. And because of their fear, they're doomed. Numbers 13, you can track it on the timeline. Numbers 13 takes place <coughs> just two years and two months after Israel's escape from Pharaoh in Egypt. It really isn't very long. They spent one year on Mount Sinai. So after two years and two months of being in the wilderness, they're here on the brink of entering the Promised Land, just two years and two months after they left Egypt. But by the end of Numbers 13, the promise of the Promised Land is pushed back 37 years and 10 months into the future. 
And in the process, an entire generation is doomed to die in the wilderness. And this is what gets me. Whenever I read this story, the human soul, it's, it's, it's yearning and longing for freedom. It's so natural and so strong that among the slaves in Egypt, those cries could be heard by God and God responded to them. That yearning, that strong and powerful yearning for freedom on account of fear was completely overwhelmed. And, you know what the first thing the children of Israel decided to do? Read about it in Numbers 14. First of all, they cry all day and all night long. Why have you done this to us, Lord? Why have you done this? And then, you know what they decide to do? Go back to Egypt. Let us choose a captain and go back to Egypt where we can be slaves. This is what fear does. Physiologists tell us that fear affects the human body in many different ways. And as Numbers 13 unfolds, the narrative, we can see those many things impact not just a single person, but the whole people of Israel. It is a classic good news, bad news scenario, right? The 12 spies bring back good news. Hey, the land is good. It flows with milk and honey. They brought pomegranates and figs and that huge cluster of grapes that was so big it had to be slung on a pole and carried by two men. Here is the fruit of the land. Isn't this amazing? Wow. But, I often think but is the longest word in the English language. It's three letters, but look at its impact. But, there's bad news. The indigenous people are strong. Their towns are fortified. This task of occupying the promised land, it's not going to be easy. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? And isn't this typical of human nature? You have good news and you have bad news, right? And what, what takes over? It's almost never the good news. It's always the bad news. The bad news infected the children of Israel like a virus and a toxin. And it poisoned the whole assembly to the point that they couldn't believe. Caleb protested. He said, look guys, let us go up at once and occupy the land, for we are well able to overcome it. But nobody listened to him. Nobody stepped into this moving tide of panic and said, hey, let's just take a deep breath and think about things. And let's remember Let's remember what God did when it looked like the most powerful army in the world that was poised to destroy us. And we crossed the sea on dry ground while Pharaoh's armies and his chariots were drowned in the water. It never happened. It never happened because of fear. Fear provides for no careful reflection. Fear allows for no introspection. Fear allows for no consideration of anything except the worst, the absolute worst of the worst case scenarios. And probably its most dangerous thing is that fear constricts our ability to believe, especially to believe in the promise that with God, nothing will be impossible. I hope you read the story when you get home. Numbers 13 and 14. There you'll see the evidence all laid out. 
And the tragedy is, the children of Israel, Numbers 13 and 14, are not destroyed by the Hittites. They're not destroyed by the Jebusites. They're not destroyed by the Anakites, the descendants of which make them seem like grasshoppers. The children of Israel are destroyed by fear. The hard question I ask, will fear do the same thing to the church? I sometimes wonder, it is so easy to be afraid especially in this time and place where we call are called to be faithful, especially in the midst of a world and a culture which despises faith. It is so easy to be afraid in this world where the media reports calamity after calamity after calamity with a zeal for its propagation of all crises all the time. The world we live in teams with tyrannical despots, environmental catastrophes, resilient viruses that threaten civilization. Think for a moment all the epidemics we face. The epidemic of gun violence. The epidemic of mass shootings. The epidemic of corrupt and incompetent leadership. The epidemics of violence and hatred, prejudice and discrimination. This isn't an easy time to be alive let alone to be an advocate for a faith which is largely dismissed by our culture as irrelevant. It is easy to be afraid. But remember, we don't have to be afraid. And we have Mary to lead us in this way of faith. I think about all the people in the Bible, right? There are a lot of them in the Bible. But without a doubt, in my mind, the most courageous of the people in Scripture is Mary. If anyone in Scripture could have had a legitimate reason for fear, it would have been Mary, right? She's from a peasant family. She was probably no more than a teenager when she was visited by the angel Gabriel. And on account of that visitation, she was put in a most perilous place by agreeing to become the Lord's mother. Can you imagine what the gossip was going to be in Nazareth? Oh, it's a child of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, right, right, right. Unexplainable pregnancies by unwed teenagers in those days were dealt with with a merciless severity. Do you know what the punishment was? Stoning. So you violate the community standards in this way, you get stoned. And I'm sure that Mary knew all this. I'm sure those thoughts were going through her mind. And with these concerns, there's very good reasons. Mary could have said, you know, Gabriel, I'm really thrilled that you wanted to call me. But you know what? I just don't think it's going to work. So go find someone else. Mary, if anyone could have been legitimately afraid, it would have been Mary. And with very good reason, she could have uh, declined the invitation posed to her by Gabriel. Instead, she only asked one question. Very legitimate. How can this be, for I am a virgin? And then, this to me is the most remarkable part of the story having claimed that promise that was entrusted to her, that promise that with God, nothing will be impossible, she embraced her call. And she said, here I am. Or you could translate the idiom in a military way. Reporting for duty. I'm ready to go. 
I'm signing up for this task. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. I want you to think about Mary. And I want you to think about us. Us as the church. Us as ambassadors of Christ. Called to ministry. What would the possibilities be for us? For our church and for our ministry. If we followed Mary's example. If we embraced not just our call from God. But that accompanying promise. A promise which declares with God. Nothing will be impossible. Do we have the courage to do that? Or will we let fear get in the way? God calls us to lives of grateful generosity. Let us praise the giver of all good gifts through our offering today.
Join me in our offertory prayer. We give you thanks, Holy One, for the sustenance you provide, for the shelter you give, and for the abundances we find in life. Help us to return to you the bounty of your grace. Amen. Please be seated. And hear the affirmation of faith from Col Colossians chapter 1. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him, all things in heaven and earth were created, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. Through him God was pleased to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace through the blood of his cross. Amen. I have a couple of items to share for you for prayer concerns that I have for today, and then I'll open it up for joys and concerns that you would share. First, many of you know our uh, pastoral friend and colleague, Kirk Kessler, who has um, who pastored many years in Conrad and is now honorably retired. Kirk had knee surgery back in November and just had shoulder surgery in February. If you know him at all, you know that Kirk has never sat still a day in his life. Um, and he is finding a second surgery within a short period of time to be very limiting. Uh, so please keep Kirk in your prayers as he continues in his recovery. We continue to pray for members of our own congregation, including uh, Ruth as she continues in her recovery and Helen as she continues in her recovery. What joys and concerns do you bring this day? Yeah, Rihanna. Um, Tuesday is hurricane season. Hmm. So I encourage her, everyone who's battling for appropriate care, for a condition that can only understand. And the families are appropriate. Thank you. Um, uh, Liana lifts that up that this Tuesday is Rare Disease Day and lifts up those uh, families and individuals that. Uh, struggle with and work their way through um, diagnoses of rare diseases. Thank you for lifting that up. Millie. <laughs> Thank you. I am incredibly grateful. Um, I um, am very glad to be back after COVID and yes, had a very different experience from the last time I had it for which I give grace, uh, grace and praise to God. Thank you. Yeah, Jeanette. Uh, continue prayer for Jeanette's brother. You may remember that he got ill on a uh, world travel trip uh, several weeks ago. He's now back in the United States, but please continue to pray for him as he tries to continue to heal, heal up. Yeah, Marilyn. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Prayers for Rod Ferranto, Dixie's husband. And uh, Beth. Yeah, thank you. Um, prayers for Joe and for all of his colleagues today as they close their store. Prayers that those who need employment may go on to find uh, additional fulfilling employment and prayers for Joe as he figures out what he is going to do next. Thank you. Yeah, Tana. Um, it is a blessing. Thank you. Yes, uh, prayers of thanksgiving to have Tim here. Uh, what you may have put together is that Tim had to drive through some nasty roads in order to get here. So we are grateful that you were able to make it safely today. And what we pray for the camp in its upcoming season. Thank you, Tim. Richard. Thank you for continuing to keep that in front of us. Yes, we uh, remember the world front and that we are part of a world that is very interconnected. And we pray for those in Ukraine and all of those in Europe as they uh, deal with a, a multitude of, of complications. Thank you. Uh, seeing no others, let us take these joys and these concerns of our hearts as we lift them to the Lord in prayer. Would you join with me in our response of prayer of intercession, which is listed in your bulletin? Eternal God, as we begin this Lenten journey with Jesus in the wilderness, our struggles and temptations become all too real, emptying ourselves of that which teases and tempts us to turn from you and turn toward idols of comfort that don't satisfy and don't last. We pray for you to open us to your truth and guide us in Christ's path. All too often, God, we choose the path that is known, the path that is comfortable. This Lent, let us pause to look around, discern where we are and how we got here. Is our position faithful? Do we need to redirect? What can we learn from where we have been? What new path might we need to forge to be more faithful in the future? What assumptions need to be let go? What truth do we need to steal ourselves to face? God, help us with our Lenten reckoning. We are in the wilderness, and we desperately need you as our guide. All too often, God, we prioritize our comfort and our convenience over the struggles and sufferings of others. Hear our desire to change, O oh God. Help us be deliberate in our actions and thoughtful in our choices. Help us to ask ourselves the hard questions before we take action. Who will our actions impact? Who might we intentionally harm, unintentionally harm? What voices have we not heard from? Who have we not yet considered? God, help us with our Lenten reckoning. We are in the wilderness, and we desperately need you as our guide. Finally, holy God, in this moment of prayer, we pause now to decenter ourselves and our needs to focus on the needs of others. Hear our prayers and pleas on behalf of your people. We pray for those who are fleeing violence, those who are grieving death and deep loss, those who are sick and their caregivers, those seeking healing from trauma, the victims of sexual, emotional, and physical abuse, the victims of hate, of racism, xenophobia, and transphobia. We pray for refugees and asylum seekers. We pray for world leaders seeking to resolve conflict through nonviolence and diplomacy. We pray for the idols of money, power, 
and privilege to be brought down in favor of love and justice and equity. We pray for those fighting for life after natural disaster. In your mercy, O oh God, hear the prayers of your people. Help us walk with you during this Lenten season so we can learn and grow in your embrace. Help us to follow in the footsteps of our Savior, who calls on us to pray as he prayed, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, please now rise in body or in spirit as you are able, as we join in singing hymn number 363. rejoice as we go out into the world this Lent. May we share the love and peace of Christ with all, that those, all of those that we encounter in our daily walks. Friends, as you go out away from this place, may you remember that you are each God's child who is dearly loved. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen.
Thank you.